this isn't just a win for James Courtney. This is a win for V8 Supercars. That's an awesome day of racing. Well, James, every year when the Australian Grand Prix rolls around, it's a timely reminder of the connection between Formula One and supercars, and you've probably got the biggest connection of any of us. Uh, just talk to us about, I guess, what goes through your mind every year when you get to connect with those people that were part of your very early racing career. And do you ever wonder what might have been for you? It's, um, it is a tough time. It's not tough, nothing's really that hard, but it's, it's weird because you sort of, yeah, you were that, I was that close and sort of there and living the world and how it was. And yeah, you know, life, I said, I didn't want, I, would, I don't ever wonder what could have happened. Um, but I'm a big believer in things happen for a reason and all that sort of stuff. But it, it, um, it is an unusual feeling. It's, it's, um, it's probably a weekend when I want to step up and have a, a good solid weekend. Um, just I, like, they're never watching, like they don't care what we're doing, but I don't know for my own, um, self, I just want to have a good weekend when, when it's all on. But it's, uh, yeah, it's been a long time now since then. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's great to, there's a lot of people that I still um, see and, and worked with that are still in, in the pit lane. So it's nice to see those guys. Take us back to the very beginning of your journey. Do you remember that moment or thought that sparked, I want to be a Formula One driver? What was that? Yeah, I, I know it. I was. Uh, I remember I was on the lounge watching the Formula One race, or my dad used to tape them, so I was watching it the next day. And it was the start of the the race, and they were all on the grid. There was like hot chicks kicking about, and guys were smiling, fast cars. And at that moment, my dad, I was after school. My dad was coming home from work. He didn't look like he was having a good time, and I, I was like, I'd rather earn money doing that than that. So uh, I'll, I want to do that. So it's um, it was pretty early on. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I just, that was it. My sole focus was to be a, a racing driver and thankfully it's uh, touch wood, it's been 43 years of, or not 43 years of racing, but I've never had to have a real job. <laughs> so how does that thought, I want to do that, translate then into actually doing it? Um, I suppose I was just so, I was, ADHD, so hyper focus on it. Um, so my whole life was just about that. I remember at school, um, I'd barely do enough just to pass, just to keep mum and dad happy enough. But my, all my school books were full of, full of helmet designs, you know, drawing tracks, all this sort of stuff. I was just mad for racing. And that was the only focus I had. And thankfully, my dad enjoyed, um, you know, the karting side of things. And he's, he was a little bit mechanical. So we sort of did that whole process together. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, I suppose it's, um, I don't know, it's just, yeah, blind. Just the love of the, the passion of racing. And the first time when I actually drove a go-kart, um, I was just hooked from that moment. What was it about? It's definitely the speed. Like, and the challenge of, it sounds stupid, but taming something that, that's so, as go-kart, it's not that powerful. But when you're eight years old, you're like, wow, this is so crazy. But to tame and know that you've got control of something that's, um, it's so powerful and I suppose it, it as well is, um, it's quite aspirational. So it's, it's something that not many people get to do. Um, so it's sort of, it's that mystique and mystery, mystery of it all. Um, so I suppose that's a little bit of it as well. When did you know you were good at it? Did, did the penny ever I drop? I still don't you? know. Um, <laughs> really? No, After it's all a... these years? I mean, when did you know, I am actually pretty good at this and I, I have an intuition and a feel for it. It was probably pretty early on in karting. I I got I had quite a good success straight up, like quite early on. Um, so I realised that I was going pretty good. And I remember my dad um, sort of we were driving home, and someone he was talking to someone on the phone or something. And I remember him saying something about you know he's actually he's he's doing really well and everything. So he sort of chest puffs up and but ultimately it'd be the results, you know, winning. And then once you won your first race and that that feel. Sounds really bad, but being better than everyone else, that's what then drove me to, you know, to continue and to push harder and to try harder and to do all those different things to, to continue. It's, it's like a rush. It's um, um, so yeah, to continue like a drug addict. You have that hit and then bang, you want it again and again and again. So it's um, not that I'm a drug addict, but um, but yeah. So that's the sort of feeling you're always chasing. So talk to us about the journey to Europe and how that whole opportunity came about. 
Yeah, so it wasn't an easy journey. Um, I suppose I stopped racing for quite a period of time, just mum and dad. Um, dad's a floor, uh, laid carpet for a living. They had a carpet shop and business out at West Sydney, Penrith. I was always told I was wasting my time go-karting. I'd never amount to anything and all that sort of stuff, which then fueled me to be sort of want it even more. But um, so we, dad had a drama at business, so we stopped racing for quite a while. Then a guy called Jim Morton helped out and sort of paid a bit of money and, and sort of got the ball rolling, got me to Europe. Um, and then obviously I won the world championships and those, those sorts of things. Um, but it, um, it wasn't easy, like it was, like a lot of people would probably think. I left home when I was 14, 15 years old, lived in Europe by myself in Italy in an apartment above a restaurant and the lady in the restaurant would cook and clean my clothes. Not cook my clothes, but cook for me <laughs> and clean my clothes. Um, and through the week it was fine when you know all the teams there and you're sort of mingling but on the weekends like on friday they would all go home and, and do and i'd sit in a hotel or an apartment by myself yeah. over the weekend sort of 15 not no one to talk to and just sit there and wait for the next monday and then you'd sort of have someone to hang out with and talk to so um it's not as glamorous as what it sounds um but then obviously the success was there and i won the karting world championships and then i met um it was all ending because my dad said to me, hey, look, we can't go car racing. I can't afford it. So what we're going to do, just pack in the, the go-karts because I was racing in Europe, come home, be part of the family business, lake up, it, do all that sort of stuff. And I was at, um, I went to Bathurst just before that. And um, Neil, I remember I was talking to Neil Crompton and he said, so what are you going to do next year? You've got to start getting into cars and doing that. And I said, oh, actually, the dream's over, mate. I'm starting working for dad. Um, this coming week and Neil was shocked and it's like don't do it you know don't commit and I'm like it's my dad um, but then Neil said let me talk to a few people and see if we can rustle something up. I had been racing in America for a couple of years so I had lots of North American contacts and I knew plenty of people in the European motorsport scene so through the mutual friend uh, James' dad, Jim, and another fellow by the name of Kim White approached me and said my goodness kids got all this talent what on earth are we going to do? You can't be a world champion and just end up evaporating into nothing. What can you do? I didn't have the money to be able to help, so I went to Steve Horn, who was a very successful IndyCar team owner at the time, to Malcolm Osler, who was the technical director of Raynard Race Cars, who was, the, they were the biggest racing car manufacturer in the world at that point, and also to Alan Gow, who I'd worked with as the team manager at Peter Brock's in the late 80s. And Gow had helped some other young drivers, Neil Cunningham and Paul Radisich, who became the world touring car champion at one point in the 90s. And uh, they all kind of shrugged their shoulders because it's, this is an age old problem in motorsport. But Gow saw something in James that he thought was worth investing in and so he did. So he put some money up and that was the first transitional moment that got James really started in professional motorsport. A couple of days later, Neil called and said, hey, a guy called Alan Gow wants to meet you in, in Sydney. Can you, um, can your dad take you in to meet him? So I asked dad, dad's like, yep, we can have the day off work and go in. Um, so then I sat down in front of Alan Gow um, and Alan said to me, um, motorsport's been great to him. Um, he'd like to give something back. He said, I'm not gonna pay your whole career. He said, I'll pay for your first year. Um, in Formula Ford, in British Formula Ford. And if you're good enough, then someone else will pick it up, pick you up and sponsors or manufacturer and, and sort of carry you on. So, um, and if it doesn't work out, we had a crack. Um, but if it does work out, I own you um, and forever. But it's not forever, but um, so I, he said, don't answer the question now, go home with your dad and talk about it. So I already knew what it was, I was gonna go and do it. And then that weekend I ended up flying back to England and, and um, went and lived with Alan and started doing British Formula Ford. Um, the first year, I, can't, I think I was fourth in the championship maybe, got the works drive the next year so the team paid for the racing, won the British Formula Ford championship, then got a test with Jaguar to do um, Formula 3 and F1 stuff. Um, and yeah, and then did well at the test and then I was there. I was, I was, Young kid from Penrith, 19, driving a Formula One car. It was um, it was pretty um, pretty cool feeling to have, you know, from such a young age, from eight, seven, eight years old, to be so hyper focused on something, and then to be there. I remember the first test, be there, be so nervous but so excited at the same time. But it's um, it's been a crazy journey, um, but it was amazing to make it. <laughs>